Hello World Wide Web, I'm Dragon Shadow, the internet personality best hair. And while it seems the new Tremors TV series starring Kevin Bacon is fizzled out, that doesn't mean the movie series is no longer with us, as we see with today's movie, Tremors. A cold day in hell! Released just a couple weeks ago, straight to video, the sixth movie in the Tremors franchise yet again stars Michael Gross as Burt Gummer, survivalist and graboid exterminator. Also, Jamie Kennedy returns to reprise his role as the man's son, though this time their adventures take them far, far away from South Africa. Not the film crew, though. The movie was made in South Africa. And they got a bustling film industry now. It's like how every high-end movie is filmed in Los Angeles and every low-end movie is filmed in Bulgaria. But what reason does Bert Gummer have to leave the sweltering heat for the frozen north? Graboids, naturally. Scientific expeditions go awry when said scientists keep getting eaten by horrifying subterranean monsters, and it's up to Bert Gummer to head up there and save them! And maybe actually form a real familial bond with his son this time, because evidently the last movie didn't count. But hey, if I found out Jamie Kennedy was my son, it would probably take me a little longer than 90 minutes to accept that. So let's take a look at Tremors, A Cold Day in Hell, and see what chilled scientists taste like. We open to the frozen north, or rather the mildly chilly north, as our scientists make small talk about how hot it is, which might be because it's summer, but that's hardly the most strange occurrence today. It seems one of them is detecting massive subterranean movement, which isn't the easiest thing to explain. It's alive. Big. There are no big life forms that live in solid ice. Maybe the backscatter effect brought up a rock formation. Yeah, maybe it's the Easter Bunny. Maybe it's the Easter Bunny played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Less than three minutes after the movie starts, we get our answer as to what those weird subterranean anomalies are quite definitively. <laughs> Graboids! Massive! Terrifying! And fortunately, not going to kill any dogs on screen anytime soon. They just run the fuck away. Also, wasn't the redesign explained away as the African variant last movie? The fuck happened with that? As a small team of scientists are nowhere near prepared for a graboid attack, they're all picked off so quickly, I didn't even bother bringing up who played any of them. Besides, we gotta head back to perfection and see Bert Gummer, played once again by Michael Gross, getting ready for the arrival of the dreaded taxman, Agent Dalkwit, played by Danny Kao. Is that a pellet gun, Gummer? You bet your sweet ass it is. Still should be a little more careful firing off those things indoors. You'll shoot your eye out. Bert didn't have to lose an eye, though, to not see this one coming. Dalkweed has his tax files! Your point, dickweed? Your tax position has been deemed frivolous by the IRS, and your property has hereby been seized. What? It's your basic financial crisis hook to get your hero set to the adventure. It's understandable considering Bert's age. Fuck graboids in the Arctic, my back hurts, and I'm going to miss Dancing with the Stars! To make matters worse, who should just so happen to show up but Bert's son, Travis, played by Jamie Kennedy. Of course, Bert's not the happiest to see him, but if anything, Travis does have some ideas as to what the man can do to make some bank real fast. Put some fresh content up on YouTube, try and resurrect that bullseye brand. Not doing prepper videos anymore. My director quit on me. No, he didn't. He's right here. He just had a small mental health break. Which really didn't need that big of an explanation as to why it wouldn't work. Universal. Have you talked with many YouTubers lately? Adpocalypse mean anything to you? Fuck, try uploading prepper videos in 2018 with an emphasis on guns without getting your channel deleted, let alone ad revenue. Moving on. You change teams? No, just hats! Take it easy, Bert. I had to point that out, because that way the switch from Hawks to Cubs can be filed on IMDb under Trivia instead of Goofs. By the way, he's running Chang's shop now, but with the IRS on his ass and his son popping up out of nowhere, he needs a little downtime. Not necessarily the best idea, as he's not of the most sound mind after all he's been through. Sure, having Graboid stock footage rolling across the screen sounds like a nice, cheap, easy way to have a lot of monsters showing up really fast that you don't have to pay for. Except the old Graboid design looks much, MUCH different from the new one, and they don't bring up that discrepancy in the slightest. His mental instability is a secret to everyone. Besides, we have a plot to move forward. It seems there's a call from an Arctic research station who claims they have reason to believe that they are dealing with an infestation of Graboids! Oh, why are you so sure this is a Graboid attack? Killside has all the telltale signs. Except for location! Which was also the hook of the last movie, so... Is maybe try and keep more of an open mind there, Bert? 
Eventually, Bert caves to the call of adventure, and it's on to a slow-mo march to kick ass and take names in the Great White North. Except, of course, his son insists on coming with in an attempt to capitalize on the situation and help get Bert's finances back on track. What about your legacy, huh? What about it? Do you know of any other Graboid hunters out there? Well, it was Kevin Bacon. That trailer for the new Tremors TV series looked pretty fucking sweet, but... Yeah... He also seems to have aspirations of taking over Michael Gross's role as the big Griboid hunting hero of the Tremors series after he dies like some balding, middle-aged, money-grubbing Menendez brother. Come on, that's... that's a little harsh, I think. Okay, to be fair, he's not looking forward to the guy's death with some giddy anticipation. He just would like to learn as much from him as possible while he still can. Eventually, he does manage to convince Bert he's willing to follow orders at least well enough to not piss off Bert too much over the course of 90 or so minutes, and they're off to the Canadian Arctic, being flown there by Mac, played by Adrian Pierce. Where are all the glaciers? Melting. Sled dog unemployment at an all-time high. Well, it's either that or the fact that you filmed the movie in South Africa. This would be a nice calm flight into Canada with a few bottles of liquor to smuggle, if not for the sudden ass blaster attack! Which clues Bert in very quickly as to the validity of the claims of Graboids in the area. But hey, they took out that beast in short order. And destroyed their own engine, but hey, you know what they say, if you want to make an omelette out of your own face, they're fine. Bert Gummer's in the plane, so a tiny problem like losing your engine isn't even enough to make the landing any worse than mildly bumpy. Unless, of course, you count getting the attention of DARPA, introducing our sunglass-bedecked asshole for this film, Mr. Cuts, played by Paul Dutois. Be to retreat until I get this area cleared out. Retreat? Oh, hell, we're just getting started up here. We did just recently pass the 20-minute mark. Give them more time to regret mingling with Graboids. He doesn't stick around for very long because we have more characters to introduce, like the local guide Aklark, played by Kino Lee Hector, and of course the researcher and Graboid enthusiast who called Bert down here in the first place, Valerie McKee, played by Jamie Lee Money. I'm Val and Rhonda's daughter. No. Val and Rhonda from the OG Graboid Apocalypse? Crazy, huh? Oh dear god, don't tell me they pulled a Will Smith and named their son Ronnie while they were at it. They can't stick around, though. They need to bring them and the busted-ass airplane back to the research station to introduce more characters! Dr. Sims, played by Tanya Van Gran, and the guy who just can't handle himself in a tense situation, Charles Ferrezzi, spelled FREEZE, played by Francesco Nassibini. But you have to fly me back to Montreal so I can report to the powers that be about the recent turn of events. Well, they'll just have to wait till I get this puppy airborne again. But, of course, the only way out is flying. Max planes busted and... Fucking nobody else at this station or the DARPA one thought maybe have a spare helicopter in case of this kind of situation. Now that everyone outside has met Mr. Gummer, they move inside for more character introductions. Swackhammer over here, played by Rob Van Vuren, might just be making eggs now, but he is a combat-hardened veteran who helped build this facility with his bare hands. We've also got monster drink enthusiast Hart Hansen, played by Kiroshan Naidu. We established that Hansen really likes flying RC airplanes, and there's also geothermal activity in the area, as evidenced by the local hot springs. That explains the ABs. As blasters. <laughs> <laughs> think this is funny! Well, to be fair, Bert, I think that's kind of why the Tremors TV series starring Kevin Bacon was looking like it was going to be hitting that big old reset button on Graboid Biology. Once you name one of your creatures officially Ass Blaster, you kind of forfeit your expectations to be taken seriously. Val thinks that the Graboids are, in fact, the first Graboids, released only now after the warmer climates melted the permafrost. Why they look like the African variant is a mystery she cunningly never brings up. But Bert has his own theories as to where the creatures came from that he shares secretly with Dr. Sims. You think that our research neighbors are breeding these creatures as bioweapons? Bingo! Honestly, that makes more sense than them originating here, devolving over time in America, and then revolving over in Africa. No time to explore this line of thinking too much as an ass blaster attacks! Of course, Mr. Freeze is walking around like an asshole, so a handy dandy nameless nobody shows up to make sure at least the other guy lives slightly longer. You have a minute. We need to go through the details again. We've been through it. It was an apparent Graboid attack. Graboid? <laughs> Thanks, Oscar Peterson! plays Royal Mounted, even though his jacket clearly says Johnson. This gives the man enough time to run, trip, get up, run again, and hide long enough for Bert to come in to rescue him. But 
first, a little pep talk. My balls are stainless steel. My balls are stainless steel. My balls are in the Guinness Book of Balls. Well, I, I think my balls got mentioned on the Angry Joe show once. Point of it all is the Ass Blaster C heat signatures, so this handy dandy thermal camouflage will save the man so long as he does exactly what Bert does. A daunting task as on the way back to shelter, Bert starts freaking out again, and the doctor has to keep up with his crazy ass game of Simon Says. At least until the Ass Blaster is destroyed and Bert wakes up in the infirmary. Where's my munitions, my combat vest, my clothes, huh? To your left. I can't blame the guy. What the hell is he supposed to do? It was out of frame. So we establish that Bert doesn't trust Travis, but Travis is worried that his father isn't as healthy as he thinks he is. Again. But don't let that get you down. DARPA is doing some tests on the water in the nearby hot springs, finding the acid levels unusually high. What could this mean? Graboids in the water! Funny how I got this movie to see graboids in the ice, and outside of the opening scene, I ain't seen them. We don't necessarily see this Graboid either, it's one of those cleverly shot and edited kills where they don't even have to spend any money on monster effects to pull it off. We do get a good look at what's going on in Bert's brain, however. Seems it's not just post-traumatic Graboid disorder that's got him down, but a parasitic slow-acting toxin that has been slowly growing inside him over the years. Graboid Venom. But how did it get there? I was in the belly of the beast. <laughs> Just ignore all those times the Graboids blew the fuck up and their guts got all over the area and the population. It's the being eaten part. That's the part that's a little too unsanitary. The scientists realize that the only way to cure him is with an antidote crafted from fresh Graboid venom from a living Graboid. Travis thinks this is the best course of action, but Bert has no interest in pursuing this line of thinking when they have Graboids to exterminate! Like this one who reaches in through the window and... <laughs> Graboids hurt by the pussy. With the problem of Graboids on their doorstep, the plan is to load up, prepare for war, and for the love of God, don't make a sound. Unless it's to establish something that's going to be very important later, I guess. Well, I think that a Graboid passing underneath them causing a tremor would just make the thing shake a little bit, wouldn't it? Unless one of the tentacles came up and just plucked one side, dink, dink, dink. Bink. The Graboid ends up moving away anyway, but only because it's hunting new prey. Dr. Ferezzi! Kinda makes all that effort they put into saving his useless ass even more pointless, but fuck it. It means the body count rises. Hey. Yeah, not sure the car insurance covers slow motion. Or if his life insurance covers acts performed off-screen, as while the Graboid CGI in this movie is pretty good for the budget, they still felt the need to kill this guy with that nasty, just-out-of-frame monster you get in so many movies. I can't believe what that thing did to Dr. Ferretti. You mind letting us in on it? No time, because they have to figure out what to do about these Graboids. Funny thing, there's an underground water source plus metal reinforcements that go all the way down. Utilizing this and their generator, they believe they can create an underground electric fence to keep the Graboids at bay. Also, when DARPA comes in, Bert confronts them about their nefarious plans to breed Graboids in the Arctic as a biological weapon. I'm here with an engineering team to assess the purity of the groundwater and to design an aquifer to move it out of the Arctic and into civilization. This is about water? This water, you say? Are you uh, trying to unlock the secrets of homeopathy and train its water memory to be the perfect Arctic aqua assassins? Nah, they just need more sources of fresh water for people, and their job has been made much harder with the giant subterranean monster problem. Like the one that breaks through the floor and eats one of the motherfuckers. Really makes it hard to concentrate on filling out paperwork. Now, well, on with the plan. First, they have to get everyone to the right building, so Travis hops on an ATV to lure the beast away from the rest of the group. Biomechanics are so sexy. Do I spy a fellow fan of the Xenomorph? Uh, maybe that line was to make it less awkward, or more awkward, that she has romantic feelings for Travis, and thus can get into precarious situations that can only be solved through fan service. Thanks, so take off your pants! So take off your pants! 100% no! Take off your pants, Rita! No! 
I get that it's pretty fucking cold up here, but come on, it's not just gratuitous nudity here. It's a homage to the original movie where the lady just had to take her pants off to escape the graboid. Why? I'm not wearing any underwear! So... Take off your pants! Unfortunately, they just shoot the tentacle, saving her with her pants. Ah oh, well, they need more diversions to give these two the ability to escape the truck, so Hansen drops his pants and pisses on the monsters to piss them off. With the beast distracted, they run for the hangar! But of course, Bert's got that whole slow-acting poison thing working through his blood and brain. Think of it like a surprise acid trip. Don't worry though, Bert's fine. There's a rock nearby for him to take refuge on, and all the rest of the guys keep the graboid out of the hangar with that handy dandy underground electric fence. DARPA is attacked by the monsters, destroying their facility and killing the fuck out of them! Ah oh, well, just gives Bert the chance to hoof it the last 30 feet to the hangar, and they can get back to the important things yelling at each other. Who give you the right to meddle in my affairs? Hey, I'm the result of one of your affairs, remember? Bullshit! Bullshit! No, uh, that part was established last movie. Kind of the reason he's been calling you dad all this time. They have more important things to worry about, though, like the fact that they left Hansen out there all alone on the automatic core sample driller thing, and it's kicked into gear, so they must save him! This calls for a whole lot of vibration to work as a distraction while they crank up the electric fence to double power and kill the Graboid! Well, I guess they work via Mortal Kombat rules. Electrocute something enough, and they just explode with blood and guts everywhere. Slight problem with this is the little stunt blew the generator, and wouldn't you know it, there are more Graboids about. Also, Bert fucking collapses, meaning that Travis has to make the command decisions now. This also involves finding the one surviving DARPA agent, Mr. Cuts, and negotiating a deal in exchange for his rescue. Remove all the tax liens on Mr. Gummer for the last 27 years, and give him back his house. And I'll make sure that you stay on this side of the tundra. Yeah, whatever, done. We also don't want to pay taxes for the rest of our life. Federal or state, yeah. Nevada doesn't have state taxes. Yeah, no federal taxes. I'd also like my own personal chauffeur for Midnight Dairy Queen runs, and if it's at all possible, could my cat be the new state bird? So he's rescued. The happy ending is, uh, pretty much known at this point, but no bother! They can distract the Graboid with a little music, dancing, and EXPLOSIONS while Travis gets everyone to build the Graboid trap to hopefully save Bert from that deadly toxin. Alright! When I get in position, rock the cradle. I'm baiting the hook. Oh, the handy dandy Newton's cradle, allowing them to lure the creature with vibrations without having to be near it, because it'll just keep going. In theory, personally, I've never seen one go for longer than maybe a minute. They don't need it going that long anyway, and I'm more impressed by just how exact everything else here had to be. Between the hook for the graboid, the line getting picked up by the airplane, and the exact position of the box it has to land in. If I had to pull something like that off in a game, I don't want to think about how many times I'd have to reload at the fucking checkpoint. But hey, they got themselves a handy dandy live graboid. That means that Travis can extract some venom from the glands in its throat. Which means he's got to get in its throat, which isn't the most pleasant or sanitary experience. At least the gland wasn't in the prostate. So, gonna bring up the chances that any of the other characters might have been poisoned by the graboids during all of this time? Or maybe the risk that the Arctic Graboid's venom might not make the right anti-venom for the American Desert Graboid venom? Well, there's less than 10 minutes of movie left, so yeah, the antidote works, and Bert is feeling much better. Also, they still have that live Graboid on hand, and DARPA, who is now very interested in it. Bert's rants about them wanting to turn Graboids into biological weapons was just inspirational, you know? Of course, he saw that turn coming a mile away, and has a contingency plan at the ready. You might want to actually have milked its gland a few more times before doing that. Lots of people here have graboid guts all over them, that's just all I'm saying. 
Anyway, happy ending! The Graboids are dead. The vast majority of the characters survived, and Travis gives Dr. Sims a goodbye kiss. You call that a goodbye kiss? A man brings a big bore 44 Magnum to a fight, not some broke tick 22? Hey, come on, Pops. That was at least a 22 WMR. So Travis goes back for the real goodbye kiss, and the movie can end properly on a romance, like all movies are supposed to. The end. Which means the Graboid in the opening was really the only Graboid in the whole movie that ever went through any ice. That's disappointing. Anyway, that was Tremors, A Cold Day in Hell. And well, it's not really underwhelming. It's not really overwhelming. It's just kind of whelming. A Cold Day in Hell feels like a very basic kind of straight-to-video budget horror affair. You've got your monsters, you've got your assortment of easy-to-recognize characters, a zany hook, a body count, and a happy ending with romantic consequences. All in all, it's just kind of a movie. As far as the acting goes, it's pretty much about the same quality as the previous Tremors movie. Not horrid or anything, but the only real standout performances came from Michael Gross, who was still a lot of fun to watch portraying the role of Burt Gummer. This movie was a bit more of a passing the torch onto Jamie Kennedy, though, and he's still good. Not Michael Gross good, but more entertaining than most of the rest of them. The thing that is bothering me a lot here is the Graboid biology, though. These designs were new for Tremors 5, and it was explained that it was an African variant. Now it's Arctic, and they theorize it was the original Graboid. Not only that, but yet again, Shriekers are completely missing in action. Graboids and ass blasters. That's it. It does seem like these aren't exactly the same as the African Graboid in the sense that the tentacles stay inside the creature and don't run off on their own in search of prey anymore. Still, other than that, these are indiscernible from the other kind. Overall, Tremors A Cold Day in Hell is a pretty by-the-book experience. The settings and situation are meant to mix things up, but they don't really explore either to enough of a degree to give us any surprises. The Graboids actually have less abilities than they did in the previous movie, which is very strange for a monster sequel, and the whole thing kinda is forgettable. Still, it's presented well enough with enough burnt gummer in there to keep me entertained throughout, and manages to come in at three Graboid gullet goo gatherings out of five. Funny thing, I feel like this added even less to the biology of Graboids than even the Wild West one did. Anyway, thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow. And remember, just take your pants off. Even going commando in the Arctic is way better than being eaten by a fucking Graboid. Biomechanics or 